Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back at this broadcast show uh, this afternoon of the mobile convention here in Brussels in the studio. Um, now we're going uh, to screen an interview between David Skerritt from Nimble Tank and Peggy Ansalt from Mobile Groove. Before we take off, let me introduce the two of you uh, to you. Um, led by analysts and author Peggy and Salz, Mobile Groove has become a top 50 ranked influential destination of technology and it is a respected research and consultancy firm focused on mobile search, contextual marketing and business transformation. She also has written more than nine books already, maybe more to come Peggy, and uh, she wrote Insider's Guide to a Billion Dollar App Business. And as a startup uh, owner like myself, that is what you want to hear, of course, what you need to do to raise that sparkle. Then we have, uh, we have David, um, and he is going to present some business uh, technology and behavior. He worked in digital agencies for over 15 years and as head of mobile for the last five years. He's a T-shaped marketeer, to, uh, to be precise, with an in-depth experience of mobile. And um, I think he won over 90 awards in his life until now, so he's quite a lucky bastard, we can say. And he's the most creatively awarded mobile agency there. So I would say congrats, David. He worked for ASOS, Universal and BBC, amongst others. So we're going to switch now to the interview. Uh, I hope you will all enjoy. If you have questions, please post them on Twitter and we will get back back to you as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Have good luck, Have good guys. luck guys. And I'm very, and I'm very interested, interested to, hear, to more. hear more. Thank you. Well, great, great introduction. And David, great to have you here, obviously. Um, so, uh, you know, we're walking the talk. Here we are. We talk about mobile all the time time and now we have to do it remote so uh, it's a great way to also uh, uh, t uh, you know test the water and uh, and drink the Kool-Aid so let's start off by just um, dipping into a little bit more about you know what your day job is you know you have a lot that you do but I'm more interested also in what you're seeing yes thanks Peggy um, well just to go on to the next chart we're just going to talk a, a little bit then about my day job I guess so yes we're seeing lots of interesting things emerge um, I am fortunate enough to work, to work um, and help lead uh, the most awarded mobile agency in the UK, Nimble Tank, which is about moving quickly but rigorously. And we call ourselves a sort of next generation agency so that we, we sort of think like a startup. We thrive on change and we enjoy kind of this intersection of both new and old. Um, and so just moving on to the next chart, I'll just talk to some of the challenges and some of the things we're seeing with our with our client base. Um, so in so some of our clients, I think we're, we're lucky, I guess, and humble uh, to work with many famous brands, um, along with a range of startups that are competing with, I guess, some of the big boys. Um, so I'm David, and I'm competing with a lot of Goliaths. So I've got the sort of uh, competitors with Spotify, with Tinder, with Uber, and, uh, um, and for example, I'll work with... Um, Santander is very interesting in that we're kind of incubating startup businesses, but also working on kind of large corporate challenges. So the fourth chart is just about just our awards, as you were saying, Peggy, and uh, been very fortunate so far. So um, the big, the big, big rosette there is the uh, the Can Line that we've won, which is the the only one won by a mobile agency in London, and we've also now been awarded uh, twenty one times, which is fantastic. So Peggy, I think we're we're going to talk a little bit about some of the the big numbers that we're seeing, because as we all know, mobile has become very very big and a huge business in its own right and we've seen uh, I think we've had about what six now or seven years of mobile <laughs> how many do you think it is Peggy but it's, it's it seems to be uh, it seems yes. to be a topic of conversation and I'm quite relieved actually that uh, I'm hearing that less I'm, he I'm hearing less that it's the year of mobile I think, I think you know mobile is is here to stay and is huge and I think in most countries it's now become the you know the second or third biggest channel uh, behind TV. But even with time spent, sometimes mobile is, is bigger than TV. Um, and it always amuses me that people talk about mobile as the second screen, um, but it's usually the first screen, uh, and certainly for young people. And in essence, you've got to see past the mobile to see your TV anyway if you are second screening. So I think what we're seeing is you know mobile is huge. Uh, it's creating new ventures. Um, it's also changing models. So if we go on to the next chart, I'd just like to talk about some of the scale and ubiquity of mobile and how mobile is massive. 
So um, looking at the data points, you can see here we've got, um, you know, there's 2.5 billion smartphones on the planet as of last year. And um, the forecast for 2020 is that we will see the best part of 6 billion. So we're, we're coming close to the point where there's, there's nearly a smartphone for every person on the planet. Um, and I'm sure you can agree there's some, there's some really huge numbers. So mobile's here to stay. It's huge. It's massive. The next That's chart. A... Mm. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. No, 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 no. It's fine. That's the beauty of life. Go, go ahead. Yeah. I want to hear a little bit more about exactly that. You were talking about, uh, you know, the huge growth and the huge volume, but you know, I'm really into the huge impact. You know, it influences us and it impacts our businesses and brands. Yes, it really does, and and I think you know, well, I think there are some well documented challenges around measuring mobile, um, but I think. It's, it's dangerous to assume that you, um, you're not making money from mobile. So even in retail, so this chart here is data from Deloitte. Um, it's saying that you know nearly 20% of um, all sales in retail stores in the US are influenced uh, by mobile. So it's the bricks and mortar sales, uh, which equates to $600 billion in a year, and that's 2013. So let's be honest, it will have gone up. Um, so this thing is really, you know, mobile is a way of, living now and it's something that is so fundamental to business that you, you kind of ignore it at your peril and so the, the next chart I was going to share with you is um, something I've called the three kings of video so there's um, this sort of snapchat emergence recently they have tripled their daily video views which is largely coming from mobile from two billion to six billion in just six months so that's a hell of an aggressive um, curve there Facebook has actually seen their daily video views move from four billion to eight billion in the last five months. So again, massive um, aggressive curvature there. And then finally, you've got YouTube, who were already at 4 billion in 2012, so haven't had the recent sort of double digit growth as such, um, but have done very well and are now 7 billion video views per day. Um, and of course, they all count videos in, in different ways because it's, you know, it's not always a level playing field. So, you know, Snapchat is, is actually a view. Um, Facebook is just three seconds. And I think YouTube are classing it after you've watched it for 30 seconds. Um, but I think when you look at all those data points together, you can see that it's not just about the billions of devices, but the amount of content that's out there. And, and frankly, there's, there's still 24 hours in the day. So we, we use mobile to get through more content, I think. So we're getting through more content. I mean, I just want to digress for a moment. You, at an agency and in the industry, um, we won't say that you're a video, uh, but I have heard, you know, the equivalent of that, that, you know, video will be eating the world uh, in 2016, as, as mobile was declared to have done that already uh, yeah. in, in our year. Um, from uh, the uh, famous report, you know, the famous presentation, Mobile is Eating the World. Video, yeah. what, what's your take, David, before we get on? I think video is such a powerful medium. And, you know, we always talk about, you know, the, there's, there's the data and the science these days, but also there's the, the advances in storytelling and immersion. And I think what you're going to see as we go forward, I mean, I think it's very interesting that, you know, the, the Samsung um, equivalent of Oculus Rift that's just launched is completely sold out in, in Amazon and Best Buy in the U.S., and in the UK, I think there's very, very few devices actually in people's hands yet. But I think the, the videos that carry you away, even, you know, the new Facebook formats, like the 360 video, this kind of feeling that you're in the story. You're not being, the story isn't necessarily just being blasted at you, but you can kind of have a more creative but interactive experience is, I think, uh, where I'm seeing things going. But um, yes, certainly video is eating the world. Um, but it is interesting, Peggy, the way there's always there's always the next trend, isn't there? And there's always the buzzwords we use a lot. So I'm sure I'll find myself talking a little bit about disruption and innovation. And they're the kind of words we hear a lot of in agencies now. And I believe, you know, CEOs are probably not necessarily scared of video as such. I think it's a trend and it's a behavior and it's it's kind of goes back to the birth of TV and cinema, doesn't it, and theatre. Um, but I think CEOs are probably more scared now that someone can enter their business, completely disrupt their industry and see their um, lofty position in the FTSE 500, 250, whatever it might be, NASDAQ, etc. So taken away from them. So I think there's, um, we're moving from a world of video eating the world to kind of perhaps uh, we just need to be mindful of disruption and fear as well and being brave. Well, great way to get to disruption, mm. which is your yes. favorite topic, David. It is, yeah. It is, it's one of the 
was one of the ones. So just moving on a chart. So um, so as, as well as the Three Kings video, um, I think it's interesting to look at the Three Kings of Disruption, as I've uh, named them. I'm sure they won't mind being called Kings of Disruption. So um, I guess you could say there's there's 250 billion reasons to pay attention to this chart. Um, and that's if you're any good at math, you'll see that Airbnb, Uber and Alibaba are, are worth a cumulative, as of the other week, $250 billion, which obviously is a quarter of a trillion dollars, according to my math. So um, it's it's a big numbers and I think what's interesting is the model so they're all something Harvard Business Review call a network orchestrator so Harvard Business Review last year worked out okay. there's four types of company and the network orchestrator is actually a more rare company but it has higher profits and faster um, revenue growth and basically they may sell products or services they may build relationships they may share advice give reviews collaborate co-create um, but it's things like Airbnb, eBay, Facebook, Uber. It's where actually the participants interact and create the value for the company. And that's really what's happening with Airbnb and Uber and Alibaba. So, you know, Airbnb, they don't own lots of hotels, but they're obviously scaling the competition because they're all kind of merging and acquiring each other. Uber, you know, they don't own any cars, but they do some incredibly big numbers and they're a very data-centric organization. And Alibaba, you know, really disrupting um, the way people pay and get around in China now that actually own any stock. So I think very interestingly, um, just about a week and a half ago, Alibaba took in the big numbers, broke their own records. There's a day called Chinese Singles Day, and it's kind of like uh, Black Friday, which of course is coming up this week. Um, and they did 14.3 billion US dollars of sales in one day. Um, so, you know, absolutely huge, huge numbers. And it's all driven by mobile, which is what's really interesting, I think. And also the fact that it's completely, as you say, don't own hotels, don't own cars, don't own stock. It is creating value out of no physical, uh, tangible um, value, so to speak. So yeah, right. a, lot, a lot changing there. How can we um, uh, understand then um, the landscape? I mean, what you're saying is that everything that we've seen is very new. Mm -hmm. and hasn't been there before, which probably is also presents us with challenges that we can't entirely anticipate. No, you're right. I mean, um, I mean, on my next chart, I was going to say that, you know, change is the only constant. And it's, it's what I've seen throughout my whole career that, you know, there's always, it's always the next big challenge. And I think if you don't like change, then I suggest mobile stroke digital stroke startups probably isn't the business for you um, perhaps go and be an accountant or a funeral director or something but um <laughs> but i mean customers change massively so i think what we've seen as i mentioned that you've got brands that compete with spotify spotify were very quick and have now become a billion dollar business as well to so recognize that consumer behaviors have changed so for young people it wasn't about owning lots of cds and vinyl and having a big sort of treasure chest of things that belong to them it was really that it was all about having access to it and that they became a brand that enabled that um, and then also of course they've also brought out premium and all the other things so um, yeah I mean I think you know there's, there's always the next thing to, to bear in mind but but moving on and, and talking of which on the next chart um, very interesting data from Fast Company so looking at the top most 50 innovative companies um, from 2014. They haven't actually done a 2015 yet. Um, but 80%, so 40 of those companies, didn't even exist a decade ago. So whilst you do have the, the Nikes, and uh, indeed it's, it seems odd to talk about Google as being older, but yes, Google are over 10 years old, um, and, and Netflix are on the edge, but you've got the newer ones such as Dropbox, Airbnb, WhatsApp, these are the brands where, you know, they're brave, they're changing the game, they're changing how customers behave, and they're proving that age is no longer correlating with success. That you can create success rapidly. So um, it's exciting. Well, you point out they're changing brand. stereotypes mm. about the way we think about companies, but there's also something deeper going on, uh, perhaps in your next chart, about how companies are functioning and, and making decisions, because it used to be you had to be very focused, and now it seems experimentation is the order of the day. That's right. Um, bravery and, and being flexible and, and, dare I say it, without being cheesy, being, being nimble. So, yes, the, the next chart, which is entitled Changing Ways of Working, is, 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 is sort of a story in a way, because it's, it's how, um, what's it, nimble tank, but also how our brands and um, 
or wanting to change to the world we live in, which is rapid, rapid change. So, you know, you used to have these product life cycles of 10 years to five years to three years to six months to what seems like a month now. I mean, Samsung release something new every other day, don't they? Um, but in terms of the actual software that, that we use, we're finding that uh, we've sort of adapted this, um, it's called um, Google Design Sprint, which is advocated for all the Google Ventures um funded companies and so it's a five-day methodology that that basically means that you create things with the consumer rather than sort of against them it's almost like a partnership um, you bring them into the process so that you you don't create things in a vacuum so of course you prepare and you understand you know what's the challenge what's the mission the kpis what's the competitor set all that kind of stuff and then you understand the problem a bit deeper so you know you look at behavioral data and data science and uh, you do some strategic exercises in that first day to kind of build out a landscape you then kind of diverge and you go in lots of different directions and we encourage bravery and you know you say things like this this is a bad idea which is generally the truth and um then you come back and you regroup and then you decide and you um you don't sort of decide the best solution based on sort of subjective terms but you really kind of try and get into the rational emotional and point uh, kind of point scoring grid based exercise then you prototype and get things out into hands basically I and mean, it could be software it could almost be paper-based prototyping and then you validate it by actually sharing real people and, and seeing how it fits into their life and it basically acts as a shortcut to um, being more innovative on mobile a little bit quicker which is a good job because um, as you see on the next chart for me um, that human attention span is, is rapidly decreasing um, I think it's really interesting that um, the human attention span on a single task and all the neuroscientists of the world agree on this that um, the brain is basically being rewired and reshaped by our addiction and our screen time and our mobile devices so in 2000 humans had an attention span of 12 seconds which was better than the goldfish but uh, I'm sad to report that this year um, we lost our, our place at the top of the animal kingdom to the goldfish when it comes to attention span when we slipped to 8.25 seconds and I think this is because of the nature of um, you know multitasking and uh, you get distracted easily and you sort of stop stop remembering things because you just think oh I can just look them up on Google I mean it's really ironic that you know you meet with friends you haven't seen them in ages and yet you know the first chance they go to the bathroom and you get distracted and you have to reach for your phone um, <laughs> but I believe that I mean it's particularly a problem within teenagers so 25% of teenagers now forget major details of close friends and relatives and I believe 7% of people have even started to forget their own birthday, which is pretty sad. I certainly don't forget mine. Can't, <laughs> can't wait for the cake and the birthday party. Um, but, but you make uh, a great point there, David, hmm. because what you're saying is that, you know, we are multitasking. We have a short attention span. I sort of knew that. But there's a huge impact on advertising, on brands, on products, because not only does it have to serve us, and our, our needs as empowered consumers, but we're also distracted consumers. Yes, we are, and we're really impatient. So, um, you know, for example, with load speed on mobile sites, so we do a lot of work in the, in the web sphere, and of course, you know, people are really impatient. So people basically expect a site to load in near immediate terms, but if it takes more than three seconds, you can be pretty much guaranteed they're going to have lost interest. And there's a lot of stats from Google that says, you know, that, that a lot of good, the search activity is immediate, you know, that often leads to a purchase or an action within one hour, but if you lose them, it's also highly um, prevalent that they'll go to a competitor because it's often a distress purchase so you have to be there as, we, as um, at the moments that matter as we call it um, but yes pa impatience has become a real trend and, and distraction so what we're seeing which we'll come on to talk about in a minute is the experienced design is almost becoming um, even more minable so you almost have these zero experiences where you can just talk to something or for example with Uber you just get out of a taxi and you don't do anything you know, you don't you don't transact, you don't do anything with your phone. You just get out and it happens and you've automatically got the receipt and you've automatically paid. And then if you if you choose to, you can then rate the driver. So these kind of minimal UX experiences is a result of the way our brains have essentially been rewired through mobile. And I think what's what's sad but I think I suspect will be true, I'm hoping I might be wrong, but you never know, is that on the next chart you'll see that there's lots of future products that will create more moments for this mobile multitasking effect, which will in essence rewire our brains even further to the point where we'll have a really short attention span. So for example, you'll have self-driving cars, therefore freeing up even more time to watch those billions of videos that are out there or to do more things with our money or more things with our time. Um, Amazon Echo is very interesting. You can talk to a lovely lady voice called Alexa. And of course, you've got Microsoft's Cortana, 
and all these other voice interfaces that you know free you up from you know you could be driving and you could be speaking to someone or you could even take a holiday and go and put your virtual reality goggles on so it is definitely changing our brains which is i think something as as marketers and brands and journalists and consumers we should all be very um mindful of that and uh I think we're going to see more and more people taking digital detox holidays where they have to lock their phone in a drawer yeah. somewhere. Because uh, I, do, I do think people are getting quite addicted to their phones, just as people have gotten addicted to alcohol, cigarettes, uh, computer games and various other things that are out there that could be called a vice. Well, I want to skip ahead just a little bit, David, because I am mindful here also um, yeah. of the time. But I do want to get to a point that you're making that, you know, as we are singularly focused on our digital experiences, companies are needing to become more singularly focused on their on their purpose. And you take care of brands who have really internalized this. So perhaps we can yeah. skip ahead a few Let's slides to... Yeah. Let's talk to, about purpose. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so chart 17. So, um, yeah, what we're seeing is that um, you need a rallying call internally and externally, kind of a beacon for the direction of the company. And in turn, that then manifests itself in terms of what you do with your advertising, what you do with your digital, what you do with your mobile, what you do with your people. Um, so really what we're seeing is, is a movement from brands that say to brands that do. And so we need this sort of mission statement, a rallying cry to the, to the business. So moving on to the next chart, um, I'll give you a few examples now. So Airbnb, as I mentioned, network orchestrator business, operating in essentially the space between people with um, space to spare and people that are looking with, to, to stay somewhere. I think the same is true of Uber. They're, connect, they're connecting the space between drivers and riders to create opportunities. So what, what I'm seeing a lot in terms of the, the kind of mission purpose for these, these great disruptor brands is they often use the word connect and connector. Mm. So um, just on that, we'll carry on because Facebook, I think, have done rather well. And they, um, on the next chart, you'll see that they are all about giving people the power to share and make the world more open and connected. And I think this is another real trend from San Francisco is it's not just about creating things or experiences or building a business or being successful. It's about making the world a better place and creating a legacy for the next generation and the generation after that. And I think that's what certainly... Um, Zuckerberg's trying to do with some of the, the other initiatives outside of the core kind of Facebook business. So on to the next chart, um, you'll see that, uh, yes, Nike, so um, trying to not talk too much about Nike because I did this a little while ago in Amsterdam with you guys at Mobile Convention, um, but yes, pl pleasure that I got to work on Nike back in the day, and I think they actually have the best mission out there right now because it's very positive and it's very enabling. And um, they empower this mission through the platforms they create, so the Nike Pluses and the fuel bands, the communications, the products, the in-store experience. And it's a very positive message. And I, and I think, given this this talk is about the pitfalls versus the opportunities, I'd sooner talk about the opportunities because I think we yes. can all achieve amazing things with positivity. And so the, the, the line here is, if you have a body, you're an athlete. And so I think that's um, it's a very good one right now. Do you, do you then, want to build on that just a bit because it's also um, a mm, brand that mm. you you have personally um, also yeah. served mm -hmm. as a, as one of your clients and uh, and watched that mm. evolve to be more also of a uh, a, a purpose for the for human betterment really yeah yeah totally yeah yeah they, it's it, you know and there's a management philosophy there and I think what's really interesting is that, you know it's founded by Bill Bowman and he's still involved in the the company, so 50 plus years later, and they started out as just a sneaker brand, and but now they're so much more, you know, so it's, to some it's a way of life, you know. I've seen many people with Nike tick tattoos, so you, know, you didn't get that for every brand in the world. And I think to what I was saying earlier about the Harvard Business Review for business models, they've moved from the kind of manufacturing model, the first um, form of company that I guess you could say Ford still is, and they actually moved themselves to be a network orchestrator the same as an Airbnb, the same as a WhatsApp. They're creating value through orchestrating people um, through this network effect of the you know the Nike Pluses that's used by millions of people. So yes, it's a really positive message and I think part of that positivity has probably come from the fact the founders stayed involved for so long and, and the fact that everyone understands what they all stand for so it, it acts as a, as, a, as a sort of beacon forward for them. Good point. Let's move forward a bit because we're talking yeah. about purpose. It's mm -hmm. very much about connectedness. We're also seeing it's about reinvention, if we can skip ahead to yeah, that. Yeah, let's go. Oh, thank you. Yes, let's do the second trend, chart 24, reinvention. So a uh, wonderful quote um, from Pablo Picasso. Um, he once said, art is theft. And I, and I think with mobile, we see trends come back around. So, for example, Dominic. 
entrepreneurs are actually adapting and, and disrupting themselves now. Tinder is, is kind of reinventing the kind of am I hot or not, plus the kind of act of playing cards, that kind of swipey gesture motion. And there's a lovely startup called uh, What Three Words Who are Revolutionising Mapping Through Simplicity. So yes, let's talk about a little bit about reinvention. We'll actually start very briefly now on the next chart uh, for me uh, with with one of our clients in, in London, uh, Nimble Tank, um, just very quickly. And so this is called Kitty. So this is the startup incubated within uh, Santander, and they are transforming and reinventing group money. So they're trying to make it easier for groups to. Um, have experiences together, save for things, and um, perhaps you're in shared accommodation. So there's lots of friction points around shared money. And so again, they've even re repurposed and reinvented the name of having a, a kitty jar. So, you know, the sort of stereotypical kind of housekeeping money would go in it or a shared kitty for a kind of whip round, whip round a, a, at the pub or in the bar. And so um, it's very interesting to work in that territory. But what I wanted to show today is the App Store presence on the next chart because I think. Um, it's just such a shame, um, and it definitely is a pitfall, I think, uh, when, when brands create apps and they don't think about the context in which customers are going to find them, and often it is, well, it isn't um, often, it's all the time that people find apps via app stores, but app stores aren't designed to have a billion, um, a billion plus users and a million apps on them. Um, mm. they're, they're, they're more of a catalogue, they're more of a brochure, so if there's only... 10 money products apps, then it's relatively easy to stand out. But if it isn't, you have to kind of zig when everyone zags and you have to understand the algorithm. So, so um, this is a new, new, new science called App Store Optimization. And basically, what it is is it's about thinking about the to the page, the on the page, and the behind the page. So, the behind the page is like the metadata, the on the page is the copy the images, the video, and the to the page is thinking about the journey. So people start their journeys on Google. So, you know, make sure you're optimizing a website for Google that then pushes people very strongly to the app store to download your app. You know, don't get caught out by not thinking about journeys. But basically, a strong app product means you get strong reviews, and that helps you with the app store presence because you're more likely to come up and search. And you can see just tactically the way we've used colors and headlines, and almost we've told a story, but we're standing out. It's quite a visual presence. It's also quite benefit-led, so it's being useful. So it's telling you that you can use this thing to save for Christmas, to pull your holiday bills, and for holidays. Um, but I think quite sweetly, you'll see there's two pictures there, and that's two people that work in my team so it's actually a very subtle way you can reward people by putting their photos in and just having a bit of fun as a team but equally giving off a professional presence to the market so uh, and definitely one of my pitfalls for today is try, try to think about that app store listing and make sure it tells a story and it stands out and you think about all the variables you can control and make it as, be as good as you could because on my next chart I'm, this, uh, this, there's obviously a a film called Field of Dreams with Kevin Costner. It's a bit of an oldie. Probably not everyone on this uh, well, uh, live stream has seen it before, but um, he, he kind of uh, comes out with this phrase, if you build it, they will come. Um, with, with apps, that's completely wrong. Um, I would almost say with apps, if you build it, they won't come because they can't find you. Well, obviously, that's a bit long. You wouldn't find that on a movie poster. But, um, you know, you do need to think about your paid media, your PR, your earned media, your blogger outreach, your social media, and then also just your app store presence and, and all the other things that go together like a web website because you do have to try some tactics to stand out. So just moving on with reinvention. Well, I mean, that's a good I point because it is all about dominoes. Quite... And they... oh. Sorry, I think we overlapped there for a moment, David. No worries, you carry on. Oh, yeah, and I was just going to um, go you through because you were talking about the importance of the presence in the app store and I wanted to get you to actually um, another point that you want to make is advice around experience because it's interesting that the research I've been doing for the uh, uh, for the publications I've been um, writing including an upcoming ebook in which you're also in it for, for the mobile mm. marketing association <laughs> yeah. points out that there are quite a few yeah. of Millennials that would actually take experience over discount you know you can give them something but you can yeah. give them experience they'll take it over money definitely so yeah just moving on to the third round 
end experience before we sort of close out in a few minutes. Um, mm -hmm. It's all about making your customers' lives in uh, easier, and um, and that's what it's all about. I always say that you know we talk about money and this, that, and the other. And um, personally, I'm not that money orientated, but I, I, you know, there's still 24 hours in the day. We've got all these billions of videos we could be watching, and we could be having a nice time. We could be making the world a, a better place. We could be spending that time with family. How do we give customers time back by making them do less, not more? And I think that's true of Uber with the get out the taxi and you don't do anything. I think it's very true of Starbucks. So um, hopefully you can just pan to the quote from um, Howard Schultz, who's written quite a few books, but has done a rather good job of growing Starbucks globally. And he says, no single competency is enabling us to elevate the Starbucks brand more than our global leadership and mobile digital loyalty. I'm just moving on, just the kind of last two charts in terms mm. of this experience economy as I'm seeing it. Um, the Starbucks experience is highly attuned to loyalty. So they're making sure that they're looking after their loyal customers so they can see their balance. It's a highly polished app. There's lots of rewards. It's easy to see their balance even on a, on a phone, on a watch in store, whatever it might be. And before Apple Pay came along, actually the Starbucks app was the biggest mobile wallet in the US. And then finally, the last chart for today is, is uh, save time. I think that's the key thing I want you all to think about now is how can you help your customers save time? So with Starbucks at the moment in the UK, it's coffee, but not as you know it. Um, and with the new app, um, you can actually pre-order your coffee, pay for it and be notified when it's ready to be collected. You then don't queue, you go straight into the store, you pick up your coffee and ultimately you cut through the queue. You look really cool doing it. Um, it's a time saver, and I guess to some, it's a lifesaver. So, look, thank you so much for interviewing me today, Peggy. It's always a pleasure talking to you, and, and thanks for everyone listening. I hope it's been really useful and enjoyable to you. If you'd like the presentation, you can email me, by the way, at david.scarrett at nimbletank.com. Thank, thank you so much, much. Uh, both of you, David and Peggy Ann.